Well, thank you for joining with me again. Um, yesterday, we began looking at verse 1 of chapter 3 in First Peter, where he begins by saying, Wives, submit yourselves to your husband as unto the Lord. In other words, he's saying in the same way that we would submit ourselves to Christ, we should be willing to submit ourselves in service to husbands, to wives, to basically everyone. Uh, Jesus made a real clear point to his disciples who were always kind of jockeying for positions of power, kind of a very typical human behavior. And he said, you know, the greatest amongst you will be the servant of all. And so what we see in the teachings in the New Testament about marriage relationship is the same idea, that we are to submit ourselves to one another and serve each other within the capacities that God has given us. And so in a very real way, he's saying to wives, you need to submit your, to your husbands because God has ordained them to be the leader of your family. In the same time, he's saying to husbands, you need to lead as Christ led the church in that self-giving, sacrificial manner. And Frankly, you know, whenever I've found people have that kind of relationship in marriage, you never hear the wives complaining about the men uh, not being leaders or not being loving because they see it obviously played out in front of them. There's no greater sacrifice, Jesus said. There's no greater love than to lay down our lives for one another. And so that's the, the picture that God wants us to have about the marriage relationship. And quite honestly, that's fairly easy to do when there's a lot of warmth and feeling and love and appreciation going on back and forth, you know. I see it with couples at weddings all the time as they're gazing each other's eyes and they're feeling all those emotions and all that romance and all those hormones and, uh, you know, looking forward to the wedding night and all that sort of stuff. And yet when you get past that and you get into the, the, the grind of day-to-day -day life and the pressures of raising family and running back and forth to school and the store and to work and trying to pay the bills and all that stuff, all that press of life tends to kind of squeeze any hormonal influences you have right out of you. And then it becomes very, very difficult to lay down our life for other people. Let's be frank, it's easy to lay down your life for a person that you enjoy and that is basically uh, saying all sorts of nice and wonderful things about you and uh, isn't really asking that much. But when you find somebody's being uh, has a bad disposition or they're being irritable or whatever the case is, uh, you know, it, it's a little bit harder. It's easy to, to get defensive and to get offended. And so it's at those times where we have the greatest opportunity to learn what it means to truly serve Christ. I remember it was early on when I first started teaching about marriage many, many years ago that it suddenly occurred to me one day as I was reading the Word that if I simply followed God's instructions the way I should treat my enemy, it would improve my relationship with my wife significantly. Because he said, love your enemy and pray for those who despitefully use you. And I realized that when my wife was, was being a little churlish, that I wasn't very loving. In fact, I would snap back or say something, and, and I wasn't praying for her when she seemed to be picking on me. And this is the very dynamic that Jesus says, this is where you learn to truly serve me as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so what's held in here is this idea of mutual submission. I refer to it in my book on marriage called The Re uh, Reciprocal Relationship, where in Ephesians 5.21, Paul makes a statement. He says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And the very next thing he does is he begins to explain how we do that. He says, wives, this is how you submit to God in the marriage relationship. And then he goes on to husbands, this is how you submit to wives in a marriage relationship. And so he begins to paint both sides of the picture, which unfortunately many times people miss. In fact, Paul in his letter to the Ephesians goes right down the list about talking parents to their kids and kids to their parents and then servants to their masters and masters to their servants. Or I talk about the employee-employer relationship. And every dynamic, every relationship in our life, God wants us to deal with it in a way which Jesus does. So when we ended in verse 21 of chapter 2 last week, one of the things he said is Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. And so this is the concept. How do I walk in Jesus' step? If Jesus was a husband, how would he behave? If Jesus was a wife, how would he behave? 
uh, a friend of mine, Stanley Volk, told me one time many years ago, of course, he's gone home and to be with the Lord, but uh, he told me that one day as he was being very harsh with his wife, she looked at him and said, Stanley, Jesus wouldn't treat me this way. And he says he was immediately convicted because he knew that was absolutely true. Uh, Jesus wouldn't be angrily barking at her and speaking so condescendingly and critically of her. And so she could have gotten offended and said, that's it, I've had it, I'm out of here, I want a divorce. I mean, that, that certainly was an option. But the thing is, she went right back to the throne. She went right back to the, to the cross and she said, Stanley, see the cross of Jesus? He wouldn't be this way the way you're being right now. He wouldn't act like this. And that brought immediately conviction into his heart because Stanley loved Jesus. And he was an interesting man. He's the first really mature, uh, godly Christian man that I met who was so transparently honest about his failures as a husband, as a father, as a pastor. Um, He was a guy who really began to teach me about the importance of repentance as a cornerstone of the Christian life, that we should walk in repentance. So all of this comes back to the idea that how do we develop a harmonious relationship first and foremost in the marriage? Because one of the things we find, and I started into this yesterday, is that we find increasingly people are just skipping marriage altogether because they don't want the commitment and the responsibility. And the reason why people want to live together rather than be married, they think that that keeps them from getting uh, financially, economically, socially, and even emotionally entangled with another person that basically when you become unattractive to me, I can just simply move on and find somebody new. The problem with that is that infatuation, which is that warm, tingly feeling you get, only lasts about two years at the max. It literally, it's a chemical response where you see the other person through rose-colored glasses. But it just takes time of living that with them every day that you begin to see that they their humanity becomes on full display and their sinfulness becomes even more clear. And very quickly, uh, we might say the, the, the bloom is off the rose. You know, <laughs> it's no longer this sweet smelling thing. And suddenly the hard, rough re- reality of living in harmony with other people begins to strike us. And this is a, the failure to be able to learn this in a marriage relationship not only affects uh, family relationships, it affects the church relationships, and it affects our witness into the world. So if there's anything that characterizes the world's view of Christianity, it's a bunch of people fighting with each other over things that they don't think are all that important. And uh, so unfortunately, too often, it's true. I think one of my favorite stories is of a church which got into a dispute over whether or not instruments should be part of the worship service. And finally, they became so rancorous that they decided to split and form two separate churches. One was the non-instrumental church, and the other one was the ones who had the instrument. Well, the non-instrumental group, when they built a new church building, they made the doorway so narrow that they would never be able to get a piano or organ or any other size of instrument through the doors. They were going to make sure that they never had the chance to do it again. And the world looks at that and goes, you guys are kind of crazy. And yet we find oftentimes as Christians, we behave in kind of ridiculous ways. We, we major in minor issues. And so even though I might not see something the same way somebody else sees it, unless it becomes extremely heretical and misleading in terms of somebody's walk with God, uh, basically it's between you and God. And I don't want to, I'm not going to argue. I'll share with you my point of view. I'll share you how I see it, but I'm not going to fight with you over it. It's kind of like a spiritual gift, especially the gift of tongues. Christians go hammer and tong against each other over that issue. And uh, I know what I believe, and that I, I embrace that, and I'm not embarrassed of it. But the whole point is, I'm not interested in arguing about it. I mean, tell you why I think in Scripture it says what it says. But if you don't agree with that, well, that's between you and God. As Paul would say, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. So I think it's important that we understand this because of what Paul says further on in this same verse, the why behind the reason that we should behave in a Christ-like manner in marriage and all relationships. So that he says, if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words. 
I'll expand on that further, how that applies to marriage as we continue this conversation tomorrow. God bless you and have a great day.